Johnny Dollar. Pat Fuller, Johnny, at Universal Adjustment Bureau. Well, hi, Pat. Huh? Pat Fuller, did you say? That's right. Well, how come? What? Well, Pat McCracken's always been my contact over there at your place. Five or six years now. Haven't you heard? Pat's retired. Retired? Yeah. At his age? Well, he's only about, let me see, uh... Fifty on the nose. Been here since he was 25. So now he's off and gone with a real nice pension from the company. Son of a gun. Well, I always did know I was in the wrong end of this business. You want a job as a company man? <laughs> Come on over. Who knows? Maybe you can live long enough to earn a nice soft pension, too. If that is, you'll do the same thing he did that I'm doing. What do you mean? Well, you know, instead of keeping your own hours, traveling around all over the country all the time, new places, new faces, lots of excitement, well, you'd have to be tied down to a desk nine to five, day after day, month after month, year after year. Yeah. But think of the advantages. You'd have Christmas off and New Year's and the Fourth of July. Well, now, uh, let's, uh... And all sorts of free life and health insurance and other benefits. A couple of weeks off with pay every Let's forget year. it, Pat. I think I'll stay freelance and free. Whatever you say, Johnny. Anyhow, with McCracken gone, I've taken over. Well, what's on your mind? And I hope it's something that'll get me really away for a change. Don't ask for it. Before this thing's over, you may find yourself having to cover the whole country, from stem to stern. Oh, it sounds intriguing. What is this thing? One of the oldest and simplest rackets that ever hit the insurance business. But one of the hardest to catch up with. Tell me all. Why don't you come on over here? I will. All right, I'm on my way. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the be or not to be matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, a dollar twenty for a cab to Universal Adjustment Bureau down on the square. Pat Fuller was about 40, I'd say, and in spite of his easy, casual manner, it was obvious he didn't miss a trick. Very much like his predecessor, Pat McCracken. Oh, glad to see you, Johnny. How are you, Pat? <laughs> oh, fine. Sit down. Let me tell you all about it. Okay. Cigarette? Thanks. Yeah. Now, as you know, Johnny, here at Universal Adjustment, we handle claims for a list of insurance companies as long as you're on. I know. And all over the country, every state in the union. Uh-huh. But only the sizable claims. The little ones for a few hundred, a few thousand dollars, well, it's cheaper for the companies to handle them, to pay them off themselves. Sure. However, they're all required to inform us about them, even if they involve only pennies. I see. But unless there's something unusual about those small settlement reports, they're simply glanced at and then filed away. Well, now I take it you've run across something unusual. I sure have. You see them here? Thirteen reports and claims paid out by 13 different companies. The smallest for $250. The largest, thanks to an impulsive darn fool hotel manager, is for over 4000 You said for one of the oldest rackets in the business. False injury. Ah. Uh-huh. Like the one I busted out on the coast a while back with some old wino was carefully run down, his leg broken, then the insurance split with him. Mm, something like that. These reported injuries were all the results of falls. Sounds like the hotel or department store caper then. It is. Hotel. Yeah. Couple goes to a nice hotel, registers just for one night. The man carefully explains to the clerk that they have important business in some other town the following day. Sure. Just before checkup time, they casually walk across the lobby. Mm-hmm. And she suddenly trips on the edge of a rug or slips on the polished floor, lets out a yell of Oh, I know the rest. He yells for the manager, hauls her up to the room. By the time the manager gets there, she's putting on the agony act, and they threaten to sue the pants off the hotel and raise a big stink. Right. They usually demand around 100000 Threaten to call in some local lawyer they just happen to know. Yes. And the manager, all excited and hoping to avoid a lot of adverse publicity, as well as a lawsuit, has them sign a release. Pays them something in cash, whatever they can talk them into, and they're on their merry way. Pat, why don't these hotel managers ever learn to hold on to people like that and make them undergo a medical examination? Oh, this pair's clever, Johnny. In more ways than one. How do you mean? Well, the woman usually slips on a spot of oil or grease. Who's to prove that they put it there themselves? After mm-hmm. all, nobody's watching them every second, simply because nobody knows who they are and what they're up to. Yeah, I see what you mean. But Pat... Also, Johnny, in every one of these cases, 
some doctor has been called in, made a quick examination, and confirmed the fact that there was an injury. And insisted that they stay around for a while? No, no, no. Like I said, they've already established the fact that they have to be in some other city on business. Thousands of dollars at stake. <laughs> that if they're made to stick around, then they'll really sue. Yeah. Thirteen in a row, you say? It's all over the country, and all within less than four months. Doggone it, Pat. If there really is an injury in each case, at least enough to fool a doctor. I know. That's puzzled me, too. Well, it, uh, it doesn't sound like the same couple, then, does it? But it is. I'm sure of it now. Why? Well, Johnny, you know as well as I do that most crooks develop a sort of pattern, whether they themselves realize it or not. Well, you know that some of them set a pattern deliberately, you know, leave a regular trademark just to show off. Right. Or just to make the cops look silly. Exactly. Now, they haven't used the same names each time. Oh, no, no, of course not. But what they have done... Now, what about their descriptions? Is it covered in these reports? Oh, yes. But they, they don't mean very much, because one time she's a blonde, the next time a brunette, and then a redhead, you know. And the same thing goes for him. Thick glasses one time, a mustache another, mm. clean shaven the next, and so on. Yeah. But look, here. I have a picture of them. Oh? How'd you get this? Photographer in a hotel lobby in Chicago, taking pictures of a model, showing off some clothes. They happen to be in the background. Uh -huh. You see? There they are. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, fine. This this will be of help. <laughs> Even if they, uh, even if they fool around with a disguise or two. But now to get back to this pattern that you mentioned. Really, the show-off element, as you call it. Yeah. The home address they give when they register. Fictitious one? I don't know, but it's always the same. What is it? Twenty-first Street and Fairmount Avenue. Where? Philadelphia, PA. Mm. Well, if it isn't fictitious, it might give us. Twenty-first and Fairmont. Yes. In Philadelphia. That's right. <laughs> oh, great! What? That's something to work on, all right. Pat, this case may be tougher than you think. Could even be dangerous. Oh? That is, if that address ever really was his. The man. Why, Johnny? What is it? A not-too-exclusive little place known as Eastern Penitentiary. Winter time is trouble time for many of us who leave our cars out at night or in unheated garages. So don't ask for trouble. Ask for DuPont Xerox Antifreeze. Xerox outlasts winter. It protects your car against sudden drops in temperature all winter long. It won't boil away even during a warm spell. And Xerox has an exclusive rust inhibitor, MR8, that protects all engine metals, including aluminum, against rust and corrosion. So for safe, dependable protection, do as millions of motorists have done for over 20 years. Ask for Xerox Antifreeze. It's made by DuPont. Remember, for cars left out at night or in unheated garages. Don't ask for trouble. Ask for DuPont Xerox Antifreeze. Okay, now, Pat, you could spend a lot of time and money sending a copy of this picture to every hotel in the country together with a warning to look out for this couple. But do you know how many hotels? But it probably wouldn't mean a thing. Because of the way they change their appearance somewhat each time. Mm-hmm. And because they're pros and they're smart. They'd get wind of the fact that they're being looked for and duck undercover, maybe even try some other caper until the heat died down. After all, if they're clever enough to stand a doctor's examination... Because I still don't get that part of it. I don't either. Anyhow, to really nail them down, it looks to me like they'll have to be caught in the act. But how can you possibly know where they'll operate next with this fake injury racket? Now, you said they've been all over the country. Look for yourself. Boston, Philadelphia, Houston, Albuquerque, Chicago, Miami, Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine, Portland, Indiana. They seem to like that name. Part of a pattern? Uh, who knows? Go ahead. Seattle, Wichita, Kansas City, and Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I'll be darned if I can see any pattern. That's a pretty smart to move around so much. It'd be a lot easier to figure the next move if they covered one area, even one state at a time. Yeah, there might be a chance of finding some plan in their movements, but there was only a relationship between these cities. or even some alphabetical order. Something to latch on to. A pattern? Yeah, some pattern aside from their method of operation. And of course, that ridiculous address. A state penitentiary yet. Maybe there is. Hmm, what? It's only a wild hunch, but... Sometimes those are the ones that pay off. What are you thinking of? Can I borrow this picture of them? 
Sure. And a list of the towns they've hit so far. Of course. I take it there's no question about my being on expense account. Well, of course you are. <laughs> All right. Where are you going, Johnny? What are you going to do? You think they'd like to see me in the state pen? Expense account item two. 2410 for a cab to Bradley Field, a plane to the city of brotherly love, and then a cab to 21st Street and Fairmont Avenue, Eastern Penitentiary. One of the assistant wardens was all cooperation, and after studying his records for a few minutes, he came up with some highly valuable information. Yes, Mr. Dollar, it's Harry Bain, all right. There's no question of it. Harry Bain? He finished out his term for burglary only a little over a year ago. Burglary? Yeah, and I must confess, I'm not at all surprised that he's operating again. Also, I'm not surprised that he's changed his type of operation. Why do you say that, Wood? He's a very clever criminal. If for no other reason than that he was able to escape conviction for so long. He had an arrest record a mile long, you know. No, I didn't know. Yes, all over the country. Chicago to Houston to Seattle to Miami, all over. I see. But they could never convict him. Because always before he'd pull a job, he'd enlist the services of some local mouthpiece. Go on. Yeah, he'd have an alibi rig before he made a move. It was only by actually catching him in the act with the goods in his possession that they were able to nail him down here in Pennsylvania. In other words, what you're saying to me is that I'd better catch him and that female partner, catch him in the act. Yes. But are you sure that he and his partner have pulled all these fake injury jobs? You're thinking of a doctor's opinion each time that there really was some injury to the woman, a really sprained ankle or a busted knee or whatever. Yeah, of course. After all, recovery from something like that some 13 times in only four months. I know, I know. It bugs me, too. Unless you can definitely prove there's no actual injury after one of her falls, and regardless of a doctor's opinion, mind you. In other words, Mr. Dodd... In other words, Warden, the first thing I have to do is find out where they're going to pull their little stunt next and be there when they do. Yes. All right, then. Maybe that's where you can help me. How? You have a list of all the cities where this Harry Bain operated before you got him... Yeah, right here. Boston, Houston, Fort. No, no, wait, just just one minute now. Just let me uh, let me check your list against this list of mine. All right, now go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Boston, Houston, Portland, Oregon. Check. Portland, Maine. Right. Portland, Indiana. Right. Miami. Wait a minute. Huh? Yeah. New, all right. Go ahead. Go New ahead. Orleans. Oh. Chicago, Seattle, Wichita, Minneapolis, Albuquerque, mm-hmm. Little Rock, Duluth, yeah. Kansas City, and here in Philadelphia. Good. Then there is a pattern. Uh, a what, Mr. Dunn? You gave me the same 13 cities that I have on my list. All of them places where he already had a contact with a crooked lawyer from his burglary days. Oh. Also, you gave me three new ones. New Orleans, Little Rock, and Duluth. Towns that he hasn't hit yet with this new racket. But I'm betting that he will hit them. New Orleans, Little Rock, and Duluth. Right. And if I can be there when he tries it. Excuse me. Yes? Is Mr. Johnny Dollar there, Warden? Yes, he is. Uh, uh, Just a minute. It's for you, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Pat Buller, Johnny. They've done it again. Where? Little Rock, Arkansas. Good. Good. Sure is, Pat. I'm on my way. What? Where to? Well, take your choice. New Orleans or Duluth, Minnesota. What? The most effective aid to needy families abroad is given each year through the religious organizations of America. They are so efficient that a single dollar will send more than 300 pounds of food to feed hungry mouths in lands overseas. But our religious groups go much further. Besides food, they send clothing, medicine, and bedding. They help support hospitals and clinics and develop self-help projects. Keep faith with those in need abroad. Give through your faith. Item three, two and a quarter for a cab to the Bellevue Stratford. And there I ran up item four, $181.40 in phone calls to the manager of every sizable hotel in both Duluth and New Orleans. I'd got a list from one of the big hotel associations that was only too glad to help. 
<laughs> Item five, $61 even for all the books, magazines, and papers I could read and for plenty of room service. I didn't even go out for meals. After three days of it, I just about had my fill of doing nothing but reading, eating, and sleeping, but then... Johnny Dollar. This is Monsieur Jacques Devereaux at the Hotel de Philippe in New Orleans, Monsieur Dollar. Yes. I promised to call you if anyone from up there in Pennsylvania happened to register here in our splendid hotel. Yes. We now have with us a couple by the name of Chatsworth. Monsieur and Madame Henry Chatsworth. Oh, so it's Chatsworth now. But they're such lovely people. From here in Philadelphia. Yes, but they're such lovely people. And they gave 21st and Fairmont as their address here? Yes, they did. But they're such lovely people, Monsieur Dollar. Now, listen. I just refuse to believe they're those horrid rascals that you telephoned Now, you just hang on to them. I'll grab the first plane I can. Hang on to them? What? But they're only staying overnight. I know. Monsieur Chadwell has to go north on business tomorrow. That's what he thinks. (laughs) Item six, four dollars for a cab. Item seven, eighty-one forty-five plane fare. But the only flight I could get didn't leave until the wee small hours of the morning, so it wasn't until after breakfast that we finally pulled into New Orleans. Item eight, another four bucks for a cab to the Hotel de Philippe. And there, the prissy little manager suddenly became a real problem. And I tell you, Monsieur Dollar, that I simply refuse to believe that that nice Monsieur and Madame Chatsworth are those horrible cooking men. Why, they're lovely people. Mr. Devereaux, what's wrong? You're only a private investigator. You have no real... I know that only too well. And for that reason alone, sir, I must refuse you admittance to their... Would you please listen? If you wish to call in the police, have them station their men about... A bunch of police swarming all over this place? Harry Bain, who calls himself Chatswood, would smell them a mile away. He and the Dame Whittle would simply take a powder. At least that would save my hotel from any embarrassing situation, which is all I care about. Sure, and would let them scot free again. And I simply refuse to believe that such lovely... You people. said that. And I meant it too, sir. Now, if that's all, Monsieur Dollar... Oh. All right. All right, Mr. Devereaux. You almost make me wish they would knock you over. I have told you... You would... simply refuse to believe. Yes. Now, must I order you off the premises? <sighs> you mind if I stop at your bar long enough for a drink? I think I need one. Not at all. But I shall be watching oh, you. Oh, I'm sure you shall. Oh, good morning, Mr. Chatsworth, Madame Chatsworth. Huh? Oh, you're up early this morning. I ducked behind a pillar and listened. Oh, yes, monsieur. We plan to have breakfast. I could in your catch only snatches of their yard. conversation. So bad you can't and I just prayed that Devereaux wouldn't tip people. him off. Well, we'd like to stay, Mr. Devereaux, but we've got to leave for New York. Big business deal up there, and if me and the missus aren't there right on time to sign some papers, it could cost us a fortune. I mean, really big money. Yes, yeah, so we're all packed, and we'll be leaving right after breakfast. Oh, I'm so sorry. But of course I understand. Sure, I knew you would. Well, come along, dear. Yes, Henry. Oh, my, am I hungry. Hmm. Now, Monsieur Dollar? Monsieur Dollar? While the manager looked for me in the bar, I ducked across to the other side of the lobby, grabbed the bellboy, and shoved a five-spot into his hot little hand. But for what, sir? Mr. and Mrs. Chatsworth, the number of their suite. Well, it's 214, but uh, may I ask you why... Good. Now, where can you and I have a little talk all alone? But even a ten spot wouldn't persuade him to part with his uniform for the rest of the morning, so uh, I'm afraid I had to use other tactics. So I made sure he was comfortable in the linen closet where I tied him up, gagged, and left him. Then, grabbing a handful of towels, I ran up the back stairs to the second floor where, thanks for the borrowed bellhop's uniform, and it was a pretty sad fit, a chambermaid let me into 214. The Chatsworth luggage was packed all right. They were all ready for takeoff. But I had to find some clue as to how they passed the medical examination after one of the so-called accidents. So I carefully went through the bags one at a time. Now, what did I find? You'd never believe it. It was nothing more or less than... I heard a key in the door, so I slipped into the bedroom and under a bed. Oh, Henry, this is killing me. Killing me? Yeah, I know it, honey. And boy, you get that manager up here and the doctor, too. Did you hear me? Okay, now, where is it? We gotta act fast. Oh, here in this suitcase, Henry. Good. Now, pull down your stocking. What? What's the matter? 
I thought I'd lock that suitcase. Well, never mind that. Don't worry about it now. Here. Are you ready? Mm, as ready as I ever am, I guess. I just wish it didn't hurt. You ought to be used to it by now. Here we go. on that business deal, it could cost us a million. So if you make her stay here, I'll sue you too. The way I'm going to sue this hotel for that slippery floor down there in the lobby. Please, Mr. Chaswood, not so loud. You know what's good for you, Sawbones? You'll give her something to ease the pain so we can catch our plane. Then you'll get out of here. Please, Doctor, you better. And as for you, Mr. Devereux. Yes, sir. Well, I've heard plenty about cases like this, about you hotel guys being so careless with slippery floors. And I'm going to sue you for $50,000. Please, Mr. Chatsworth. Okay. Okay, you've been nice to us, so I'll make it 10 or 15000 Oh, no. You know a lawyer by the name of Frankie Tobello? That crook. One of his. All I care is he gets me ten grand for this. Mr. Chatsworth. Yeah? Perhaps the injury isn't as bad as it looks. And if we pay the doctor's bill and, uh, say, uh, 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 two or three hundred dollars... What? You're out of your mind? But I don't want a lawsuit or the publicity. And I'm only trying to, uh, to, uh, to... Uh, 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 a thousand, perhaps? In cash? Immediately? Now, listen. I've got you over a barrel and you know it. So you're going to pay for this and plenty. Now make me a decent offer. And the price they settled on? Two thousand bucks. Cash. Immediately. But as Devereaux, the poor excited sucker, was about to go downstairs and get it, I crawled out from my uncomfortable spot under the bed. And you know something? Henry Bain and the woman gave up without a struggle when they found out who I was and what I was doing there. And the manager, when I pulled the little glass jar out of their suitcase and showed him how they made their phony accident look so real. Real enough to fool a doctor. Well, believe it or not, the shock was so much for him, he almost fainted. So, that was that. And the expense account total comes to $471. Wait a minute, I forgot to tell you about the trick. Their little trick for making that ankle swell up and look like the worst sprain on record. You see, that jar, the one that Bain had opened and then clapped against her ankle, contained exactly three nasty little yellow jackets. Bees. Yes. Clever. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one of the nicest killers I've ever met. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were John Thomas as Pat Fuller, Ivor Francis as the hotel manager, Robert Dryden as Harry Bain, alias Chatsworth, Gertrude Warner as Mrs. Chatsworth, and Bob Donnelly as the assistant warden. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hannah speaking.